everybody, I am Erica Gemma, CEO of the Blockchain Center Miami, your host today. And I am here to bring you some knowledge and two very special guests. I will let these lovely ladies introduce themselves, but first, while we are waiting for people to join the stream, some housekeeping items. Um, a special shout out to Anna Ginsberg, the producer of this show. She makes it happen all of the time, but most especially on Thursdays. If you are interested in learning more about the Blockchain Center and what we do, please subscribe to our mailing list at blockchaincenter.com. Due to the coronavirus, we have moved almost everything online, but you can join us for free online trading Tuesdays where we read charts, uh, we do some technical analysis. On Wednesdays, we have Erica Manganaro where he teaches a wide range of topics for blockchain developers for free. And on Thursdays, today's show is where we bring experts like Tal and Donna on from the industry to you. All of our programming online is free. And so subscribe to this channel, please like this video and sign up for post notifications so you know when we're going live. Also, if you are interested in learning more about the blockchain industry, the Blockchain Center has partnered with UC Berkeley and Miami EdTech to bring students a business and legal understanding of blockchain, as well as a blockchain certification. You can sign up for the next cohort on blockchaincenter.com slash education. So now with all that being said and all of our retweets going out, Thank you to everybody who is joining and thank you to everyone who will be watching the stream later. To get to our guests, I talked about uh, Algorand being on the show and I got a lot of really great feedback from Twitter. Um, people really love the project and I have Miss Talra Bin, the head of research at the Algorand Foundation. Tal was listed in the Forbes top 50 women in technology. And I also have Donna Riddell, who is the chairman of the Commodities Exchange joining us today. So if you could ladies could please introduce yourself. Donna, go ahead and go first. Okay, um, so let me just say that this is this is such, I mean, I have been now on a, a few panels with Algorand, um, including including their founder, Silvio, uh, in the on an EU academic committee. So as you rightly pointed out, one of my first um, big ideas was to be chairman of the Commodity Exchange with selected position. We then, um, because of uh, what I saw happening in technology, we started a trend which was merging with the New York Mercantile Exchange, and now uh, all of the exchanges that are commodities are consolidated. After that, I was the head of the World Economic Forum and now heavily involved in blockchain, mostly from a, both a, an investment perspective at New York Angels and in other, in other places, and teaching a number of courses at Fordham Law School. Um, so that would be a very, very short summary of what I have done and, and and the influence that I might have done on others. So let uh, Tal go now and she can talk about all that they're doing, which is incredibly exciting. And I hope, and I, I was speaking with one of her people next week to be able to get them to come and talk to my students at, at Fordham about uh, their project and how it fits in with the industry. Hey, hi everyone. Um, I am a cryptographer in training. I've worked as a cryptographer for uh, 23 years at IBM Research. That was my first and only job until uh, a year and a half ago when I moved to Algorand. Uh, very non-typical of people in our industry that uh, switch jobs all the time, but I was in that uh, group at IBM and I loved it. We were five cryptographers. And in fact, we all came as a group to the Algorand Foundation um, to try and see what we can do in this uh, new and exciting world of uh, cryptocurrencies. The um, Algorand Foundation is separate from the Algorand company. We're a non-for-profit and we're um, supposed to be doing a, a variety of things. One is um, making sure of the distribution of the token to the community, but also we're supposed to be building the ecosystem, developing the blockchain, getting people to join as developers, as users, and also um, have a 
um, a grant program that we're distributing of 250 million tokens and also to do all kinds of philanthropic work. We're hoping to get all kinds of projects launched, be more of a, a philanthropic. I'm getting a terrible noise. Um, I can hear you. Are, are, uh... I think it happened when Donna muted her um, uh, system. Uh, no, I muted my I mute my my mic when somebody else is speaking. Now not muted. Okay, were we good on the noise? So good. good. Okay. Is it still happening? No, now it's better. Okay, perfect. Are you in Israel? No, I'm in New York. I was going to say, it's like it's, it, it's the middle of the night if you are. Yeah. The Algorand Foundation, the research branch, is here in New York. We were all in New York, and IBM Research was in Yorktown Heights. So we all lived around here. And uh, that's why this research portion is here in New York. Excellent, excellent. I'm, I'm glad that when you're not in the middle of the night. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I am really happy to have two ladies on this show organized by Anna, who is also a woman, definitely representing for women in technology. Um, we need to spread this group around in some of the panels that I saw today in DeFi. And we could, you know, populate 80% of them uh, with a woman, because I, uh, I would say, with the exception of the moderator, I saw zero that had women in them. Mm hmm. Yeah, well, they need both of you on here. You guys are both very, very, very impressive. I mean, I do some DeFi swaps, but I don't, yeah. D definitely two ladies to look up to you guys right here. So Algorand, okay, Algorand is ranked number 43 in terms of market cap. And today it's up 8% against the US dollar. It's up 7% against Bitcoin. There is a total supply of 3.3 billion, a current circulating supply of 771 million and a market cap of 280 million. But we are not really here to talk about the price, more about the technology. Now you guys have a very impressive team at Algorand. Um, your founder is the co-inventor of Zero Knowledge Proofs, a privacy technology, uh, Silvio Macali. He's also an MIT professor and he's also on a board with Donna, which makes him cool because Donna's cool. So uh, but you forgot the most important thing about him. What is it? Which Tell is us. he won the Turin Prize, oh, which is yeah. equivalent to the Nobel Peace, no, well, not Peace, but the Nobel Prize in the area in which he is. He is beyond, beyond considered in the world an outstanding leader and thought provoker and technologist in this area. So I underscore how important he is to be involved in blockchain, not necessarily only to have invented what his company is, but that he put the efforts of his brain, which is acknowledged by the whole world, into blockchain. I'm sorry if that embarrasses you, Tal, but I, not I at all. I support is amazing, is amazing, and the entire blockchain community is better by the fact that he validates his being there for the industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Silvio. Thank you, Silvio. Yeah, I mean, you, you're bringing a great project to the table in doing my research on Algorand. The approach to your blockchain is very much, you know, uh, very much academically reviewed. And I think that a lot of people appreciate that. So is there anybody else, Tal, that you would like to, on your team that you would highlight to bring credibility to the project? Uh, so my team, in fact, is uh, filled with uh, uh, all world-renowned cryptographers. Yeah, uh, for real. And my uh, team uh, have invented something that's called fully homomorphic encryption, obfuscation. These are big, big things in cryptography. Um, uh, the latest, biggest results that have come in the past 10 years, um, people who have designed internet protocols that we all use every day, when we uh, talk on the phone, when we send our mail and so on, the key exchange protocols for those, the hash functions for those, these are people on my team as well. Um, and uh, their names are uh, Hugo Kravci, Craig Gentry, Shia Levy, and Fabrice Ben Hamouda. 
and uh, we're all now involved in the uh, Algorand project. But this is sort of their historical work of what they've done. Uh, Craig is even a MacArthur winner, and uh, uh, many of them have many awards and so on. So really a very impressive team. That is very impressive. A whole group of tip cryptographers for your co-founder to have won the Turing Award and then for you to be top 50 women in technology, not blockchain technology, but technology. That is an incredible feat. Definitely see why a lot of people on crypto Twitter are talking about Algo a lot. Uh, now, today, I kind of want to address some tech, the technical side of things. First and foremost, the blockchain trilemma which Algorand seems to address very well, um, interoperability, and then just this pure proof of stake consensus mechanism that you guys use. So first of all, um, what makes Algorand different from other POS systems? So if you're trying to tell a client that they should be using your blockchain, like what's a good uh, selling point for you? Okay, so first of all, there are things of why you should, in my mind at least, use proof of stake as opposed to proof of work, which is independent of Algorand. And then I'll go specifically into why um, Algorand and not uh, other uh, proof of stake. So first of all, proof of stake is a greener technology. Proof of work is very wasteful, requires a lot of computing efforts. And for that reason, in my mind, I think that um, they're going to have a short li uh, life shell, uh, shelf life because I think that eventually um, we need to do things that don't harm our planet as much. And uh, as we see, there are proof of stake uh, uh, blockchains arising. And also, um, even Ethereum is speaking that it will move to proof of stake. So I think that this is definitely the future. I'm sure that uh, blockchain like Bitcoin will probably remain also for historical reasons. But I think that the things that will take hold is proof of stake. Maybe something else is invented. I don't know. But I, between what we currently have, I see proof of stake as being uh, the more... Um, uh, attractive option. We have um, finality. Um, the proof of work uh, blockchains have the option of splitting. Uh, there might be a fork and uh, it takes time until transactions are finalized. So if you're talking about having real applications where you're going to go to a coffee shop and you're want to and you're going to buy with some cryptocurrency, you can't stand there 10 minutes until your transaction is finalized. It really has to be something much more snappier that um, uh, will get going so that you um, can uh, uh, really use it in practice. So um, that's uh, another issue. Um, and uh, as we said, you didn't mention it now, but the trilemma is also something that uh, I, I think it's attributed to Vitalik, that Vitalik had introduced um, the issue of the trilemma, which is that you want to have scalability, decentralization, and security all at the same time. And Algorand provides such a solution. And uh, in addition, Another important uh, fact about um, uh, Algorand is that it's what's called a pure proof of stake, that it's not delegated in the sense that there are some few entities that are chosen to carry out the consensus protocol or the agreement protocol, which um, creates the blocks which are uh, concatenated to the blockchain. But it really is, and this is part of the trilemma, a decentralized system that is done um, by any person who owns state and it can and it's scalable no matter how many people join the protocol is still going to be highly efficient and deliver um, many transactions um, per second very cool. I have more things Say, but let's just say <laughs> for now this well you know and I, and I'm and I'm going to interrupt because um, and I'm going to answer the question I want to answer as opposed to the question you might you might ask me, which is, uh, I think that there is, a, not to say that this is new, 
But there is exactly again today this dichotomy between what is the long-term vision. And I would say, for example, Algorand is a longer-term vision as to where a protocol is going, how it will influence blockchain projects, blockchain access, whatever the, the, the whole strategy is. And the short-term trading that's going on now in the decentralized finance world. And I think that the trading and the emphasis on trading is for the longer term picture, incredibly negative. We saw that happen in 2017. We saw the outcome of that and we're seeing it again in a boom and I, and, and I did when I was with Silvio and we did the, the uh, panel for the EU, put together a number of headlines and all of them accentuate the kind of notion that we're in a boom, boom, boom cycle. And boom always has on the opposite end, the word bust. And we don't need boom and bust to be happening in the blockchain world on a constant basis. What we need is adoption. We need credibility. We need to be able to have um, authentication and trust, trust in what we're building and that it's sustainable for the longer term. We're not here for a short term game. I lived in a short term world, which is futures trading. Mm -hmm. But in the end of the day, futures trading was fundamentally based on the fact that the people within the industry needed to hedge their products. You didn't have agricultural commodities if you didn't have farmers. And so I think we need to start thinking much longer term because every time we do this hyper boom scenario and talking this up, it creates global problems for the adoption. And what we need to be thinking about is longer term credibility. Uh, sorry to be uh, oh, don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. That's butting, great, butting, butting in on your question or in what Tal was saying, but I think that their project is about a longer term vision. And there are others, not only to cite them, but there are others that also have that vision, but it gets interrupted constantly by trading that has both a short term profits and exchanges that want, again, short term profits for themselves. And I think that the, the, the fi figuring out how all of this can coexist is incredibly important for credibility and adoption, both on the cryptocurrency side and on the blockchain side. Definitely uh, sometimes having that. At, at all um, on this, but I think it is very worth talking about, especially when I see yields on yield farming going at <laughs> annualized rates in the beginning um, uh, at 68% when Compound came out and, and prices and volatility going crazy for a governance token, which has fundamentally great ideas, but the trading overtook the ideas and, and created systemic problems for both DeFi and the protocols that they're doing, whether it's Compound, Make or Die, et cetera. How can you have a headline that says there is more Make or Die in Compound than exists in the world? Yeah, I think definitely sometimes trading takes away from the fundamentals because people see an idea and a project and they forget what it's all about. So in the terms of Algorand, it seems like the major points that you want to highlight are the pure proof of stake, not delegated proof of stake. You guys have finality. So that Turing complete issue where the problem can't be solved, so it keeps running is gone with you guys. Um, you guys are solving the blockchain trilemma, and then it seems that the long-term vision, you are going to need a blockchain that has trust and is peer-reviewed like Algorand is, not purely based on price fluctuations. But I do want to talk a little bit about this blockchain trilemma. Uh, it, it is the exchange between uh, scalability and then security and let's see, what's the third one? I know you guys know. Well, the other, the other aspect of that also is a regulatory one. 
Okay, so there's a regulatory issue that is unresolved, as many of them are in the United States. Even leaving aside Algorand, there was a lot of talk. I'm not sure the talk is finished, but a lot of talk as to when Ether changes from proof of work to proof of stake, does that implicate a change in going from being a commodity to being a security? So these this whole area is still fraught with un, with regular with regulatory uncertainty mm -hmm. and so it's very difficult to talk only about the technology without um, infusing a more um, a, a greater a greater uh, a constant a greater viewpoint on a number of issues that are important which is uh, are these are these protocols decentralized? Is it that the voting actually occurs? Who does all of the uh, proof of stake? Can it be sold as it has been in other protocols where you can have a concentration of people that may not have the same point of view or, uh, or, or governance that was envisioned originally? So I think that there are many, many issues that occur here that are repetitive issues that are not only uh, from blockchain's perspective, but existed before. Governance, voting, definitely, yeah, definitely decentralization, et cetera. All of that exists. And so when we talk about Algorand or other, uh, or other projects, we need to keep in mind all of that. And so we have to check the boxes. And I think Algorand has done a very good job in doing that. And it's a global, it's a global project. So I, I do always think that we can't just think of one little aspect, which is trilemma or something else. We need to think about how does this project approach the global um, questions that exist mm -hmm. then that aren't necessarily well, answered. Well, I, I, do, I do want Tal to answer the question just for the people that are listening who have never heard of a blockchain trilemma before. What is it, Tal? And can you explain, like, I, I know you said that Vitalik made it up, but can you explain what it is and how you guys have gone about think, solving that? Sure. I think it's um, uh, Vitalik's um, uh, thing. I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's attributed to him. So what is the issue? There are a few things that, um, oh my God, am I alone? There. You're, okay. you're, you're still there, yeah. I'm still here, okay. So first of all, there's um, the question of decentralization. Who are the people that are uh, extending the blockchain or, um, in somehow participating in this uh, ecosystem. So if you want people um, uh, to participate in the consensus, um, and it's a proof of stake um, type of thing, and many people have um, tokens, this is really what you want. You want many people to hold the tokens and for them um, to participate in the consensus. This will be the decentralization. But then you're saying, okay, if I'm decentralizing and so many people have uh, tokens and they all have to participate in the consensus, what's going to happen? Can we do it? Is it still going to be, is it scalable? Can we really have 100 million people participating in the consensus? You hit an issue of scalability. And also, you want to ensure um, that the protocol is somehow secure that you don't that people cannot overtake the blockchain and fork it and do whatever so the way that algorand does it and i must say really um it's not my protocol so i can say this about the protocol i think it's really ingenious it's really one of Silvio's brainchild you see the 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 magic that he puts into protocols so he wanted to deliver a byzantine agreement protocol. This is a consensus. This is a well-known problem since the beginning of the 80s. But he wanted it to be efficient, that the people, no matter how many people participate in own tokens um, and uh, can be part of the proof of stake, that still it would be efficient. So what happens in our protocol is that a small committee 
is chosen to to run one step of the of the consensus protocol and the size of the committee is always a thousand people so no matter how many people you have it still scales because you're only choosing a thousand people so you're um keeping it efficient you choose the thousand people and they do one step of the protocol they're gone poof and a new thousand people are chosen and this combines beautifully the need for the scalability that you want this small committee but then having them run only one step only get, also gives you security why because after i say my step in the consensus everybody knows that i'm on the committee if i'm still on the committee that they can corrupt me and maybe get a control control on my actions but because i do only one step and then the committee is gone and a new committee is chosen we get really an enhanced level of security and in fact as long as 80 percent of the tokens are held by honest participants the blockchain will continue to operate properly and there will be no uh, corruptions and overtaking of the blockchain so this is sort of uh, in a, a, an overview of how Algorand really solved this issue. And let me repeat again what the trilemma is. Scalability, decentralization, where these two points sort of come might contradict each other. Because if you want to decentralize, how can you still be scalable? Things might um, um, reach a standstill because it's too big. And security, which of course is extremely important in the um, realm of uh, blockchains that people cannot get control over the blockchain. And the protocol really is um, a, a magical engineering feat or protocol design. So just a quick question then, where did the number of a thousand come from? Because I definitely like the, the 1000 of Algorand better than like the 30, I mean, I think it's 21 block producers of EOS. Where did 1000 oh, come oh, from? Oh. This is not like the ones in EOS. This is not um, delegated. Mm -hmm. it's in, in EOS, it's 21 parties that continuously develop the blockchain. In Algorand, it's a committee of a thousand which is chosen to do a single step of the consensus protocol. I do one step, I'm off the committee, you, you're on the next committee. Then Donna's on the next committee with 999 other people and so on. So th these committees are continuously changing. And based on the amount of stake that you have in Algorand, mm -hmm. that will be how often you participate in the committee. Just an example, um, if I hold 10% of all the tokens in Algorand, I will sit on 10% of the committee. But it's definitely not the same 21. The thousand is just a good number. It works well mm -hmm. with everything that the required, the probabilities that are calculated and so on. So that's how uh, the number uh, was chosen. So Super brilliant. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And and just the way that you scale within the decisions that are being made, that's that's completely brilliant. I do want to keep moving though, because I actually have a lot of questions that have been asked from Twitter and a lot of questions that are being asked right now in the YouTube. Um, so just this question is to both you ladies. Uh, Donna, if you want to go first, what is interoperability and why is it important for blockchains? Well, so, uh, you know, early, early on, I, I thought of interoperability for anyone that's ever been in the countryside of England as very similar to, to that, in the sense that when you go walking, you walk on, everything is public, even if it's private. So when you walk, you walk, you walk, you're walking on some public ground, then you come to a little gate, you open it, you're, you're in somebody's private area, but by virtue of the fact that it's a pathway, you go through it and then you end, you open up another gate, and you're on the public one. When you go on the private one, you're not invited up to their house to have lunch or dinner or drinks. You just are invited to walk on the little pathway as is customary throughout the country. 
So I see interoperability very, very early on from the, from the same perspective, which is that blockchains will work together to create this seamless way in which they fuse from one into another. And the people that are only invited in permission blockchains or ones that have special, special different ways in, in, in working up into the house for drinks. The other ones will just go around the periphery in which in the same way in which we have done so much other technology for years. You are permissioned into things without even knowing that you're permissioned, but you sign certain papers you accept or you don't accept. So I think that that's working. We see that happening um, in DeFi, though I have a lot of reservations about a lot of what is happening in DeFi, but we see that happening and working between different protocols as to what they're doing in their tokens and using them as for collateral and otherwise. So I think that in the end of the day, when we look backwards, there will be protocols, Algorand or Ethereum, et cetera, have figured out ways in which they can work together. And that they, to the people in T plus 10 years from now, they will not know that this debate existed. They will just go on, they will do what they're doing, whether it's supply chain or, 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 or financial transactions, and they will just do it. And that fact that there's a blockchain will just make it less costly for them, more quick and, and rapid. And they will, they will barely even know the difference between which blockchains they're using. And if you would ask them, they wouldn't know it. So I think interoperability is essential to the long-term growth of blockchain as a service globally. Okay, and Tal, how would you describe interoperability from a developer's standpoint and uh, why is it important to the community? I want to add one more point to what Donna said, uh, w which I agree with, but that, not but, but that, and also she said faster, cheaper, and so on, but also crossing borders and uh, currencies that people hold locally. So it's also important that you can, that it really is a global uh, thing. Now, technically, I think what um, people should know about interoperability basically it means that you can take tokens on Algorand, you can um, lock them up, give a proof, sort of the state of the blockchain, of the Algorand blockchain, and show that these tokens are blocked. And then you can go to um, uh, Ethereum, those were the examples that Donna gave. And you can get something on Ethereum and, and, it, and it's enabled by the fact that these tokens were locked uh, and that there is a proof that this is the case. You get a snapshot. And in fact, um, Algorand is working on uh, short certificates that would enable you um, uh, to verify um, the state of the Algorand blockchain when you um, uh, uh, put them, you want to use things in uh, in Ethereum. I, I just want to raise a real life example of non-interoperability. Non-interoperability generally exists in the very highly profitable gaming community. There's no, the, the, the gaming community has done a fantastic job for themselves, wonderful job in creating these games in which you keep all your goods, your tokens, or whatever they're, they're manifested of within the confines of that game. Maybe, maybe, maybe they let you go from one game within, within their ecosystem with some whatever convertibility to another. But there is not broad convertibility even within one um, a company's games and clearly not between one company's ecosystem and another. So once you enter the gaming world, you're locked into, you're locked into their ecosystem with no transferability to other ones, no matter what the monetary, psychic or whatever valuation of your tokens, your stuff, your shields, your anything is. And 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 NFT and and, and, and non-fungible tokens are starting to take hold in there. And so you now see the convergence though mm -hmm. reluctantly, very reluctantly on the gaming side of gaming and crypto. And that will, that will make a gigantic change 
in the mindset of public companies and uh, and others that have held within their ecosystem lots and lots of value that the people that participate in it can't take otherwise, including miles, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, those are definitely some very good examples of things that are not interoperable yet, like miles, like uh, tokens within games. But what you're seeing with blockchain and just the interoperability of blockchain, the technology itself, those things are going to be able to cross over and the value is going to be able to be shared much easier. But you cannot underestimate the resistance to that because these are very, very profitable companies. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Profitable with, and, and many of them are public that are want to continue the way in which they've done business, mm -hmm. not dissimilar to financial services companies that want to continue the way in which they've done business. Though you may think, or others may think it's inevitable or it's obvious that blockchain provides value to them value and i know this from having been on the exchange value is what you are currently doing and what you envision what you're doing and not what you see technology is going to change it because technology often for existing companies is i don't want to say disruptive but it makes you nervous about it's where your stream of income is going to come from yeah it Probably definitely will agree with that or or, or not I uh, I do agree with some things. I, I mean, of course, people uh, companies are always some not always. I want to say are sometimes afraid of change if it impacts their bottom line. But I think that eventually a necessity eventually. Com a necessity comes about. They see that they can't fight it anymore, and they do come on board. I want to say in relation to what you said that um, we in fact launched through our grant program, a project called Props, which is a rewards program. And in fact, in that thing, you can earn rewards and you can use it in different projects that are also part of Props. So you can have all these different rewards and they're interchangeable, which is exactly sort of what you were um, aiming at. That we do. Yeah, and you're seeing companies, if they don't get on board, they're going to have to be forced to innovate. It's the whole, you know, Cash App versus Venmo thing. Cash App saw 50 plus percent of their profits come from Bitcoin only, and now Venmo is offering Bitcoin. It just, it, people are going to have to be forced to innovate. And the internet is something that, although it is decentralized, you're seeing the companies that are on there as these uh, you know central points of data and now blockchain is really bringing just this like bringing us back to where we originally were a, in decent de decentralized in nature and it's just bringing another level to that so definitely excited really? what where were where i'm sorry where were we originally in this decentralized nature I think I'm that the world sure itself is generally a decentralized nature. Before we had technology and before, let's say, uh, the newspapers and stuff came out, people got information via word of mouth. And that was the original state of humans before we had technology connecting us to a deeper level. Now that we have technology and we live in a very interconnected society, you're seeing that next level to where in this interconnected society of the Internet, we are now getting even more interconnected. So I would say the natural state of humans is decentralized. Religion is decentralized. Many things are decentralized unless you have these places like the internet where people can come together on a wide scale. I, I fundamentally disagree with you. So I think that the reason that the SEC underscored decentralized is because the probability of decentralized from their perspective was one that was very difficult to reach. And there are very few things in the financial services world that are decentralized. I, 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 yeah, I'm not, I'm not I talking about the. I struggle to find any that are really decentralized, including trading. Um, I struggle to find any that are decentralized in communication. I do not think that the human um, uh, uh, interaction is decentralized. It is a term of art that was used by Hinman in his in his speech in April before the Yahoo conference. And we are still not understanding 
what decentralized from the government, the U.S. government's perspective means and working through that on a constant basis. We might have a technological understanding of what decentralized is, but we don't have a regulatory view on what decentralized is. Yeah, Sorry I to mean, disagree from, with what you said. No, it's okay. I think from a financial standpoint, nothing has ever been decentralized. Absolutely. You know, banks have always been you having to go to one person. I don't think that is. But I think human nature in general, you know, we get information via word of mouth until we have these gatekeepers. But I do want to continue on just this topic of what Algorand is doing. And I know that Silvio is big on the right to be forgotten. What would you say that is, Tal, and why is that important? Um, the right to be forgotten is something that is also appears in the GDPR, for example, in the privacy regulations of um, uh, that of the EU. And what it means is that you have a right to ask for something um, to be removed from records or whatever. Um, this is a very interesting question um, of whether in the internet, and I'm not talking now just about blockchain, but whether in the internet such a thing can really exist and whether it can be actually um, satisfied. Because for example, um, there are archives, right? Um, uh, there are caches. Uh, it's really very, very hard to go and track information about you if you ask for things to be removed. It's a very, very difficult question. Um, not only that, I mean, let's, there are even paradoxical issues here. Let's say that Donna has some information out there about her. I go and I submit a Google query about Donna. Then I, I apply my right to be forgotten. Now, how can somebody even identify that I have the information about Donna? And what does it even mean to remove it? So that's within the global issue of the right to be, be forgotten. Very, very complicated notion. I think that uh, we have to understand it better in order to understand how we provide and what we can provide. Now, within the blockchain, um, solutions to this thing um, first came out of researchers um, in Accenture. They uh, started saying of what they could do um, to remove things from the blockchain um, because, of course, what's the, the whole idea of the blockchain is that it's permanent, right? It's a little bit of contradiction in terms to say, okay, the blockchain is permanent, but here the right to be forgotten. So Accenture um, uh, suggested uh, some solution, which, by the way, uh, was based on a paper of uh, mine with one of my group members, with Hugo Kravchik, which is called uh, uh, Chameleon Commitments and Signatures. They used those designs um, to deliver um, the right to be forgotten. I think that also within the blockchain, this is something that we have to understand better how Technically, it's it's easy. You can do things by erasing keys and so on. Mm -hmm. But we have to understand better what we want and exactly how to deliver it. So uh, I, I want to get into some questions from the audience because we're running a little bit short on time. So uh, one question from the audience was, what does Algorand aim to accomplish in a perfect scenario with steady growth? With steady growth, OK. Uh, so the hope is that um, we'll really have many interesting applications running on our blockchain. That is um, uh, one important thing for um, for blockchain to be meaningful. Mm -hmm. Though, uh, you know, trading is what's happening. I mean, people are speculating around the coins, but you really want applications to run and so on. So that's one part. We want to have a really vibrant community with a lot of developers, with a lot of exciting ideas, with people looking at our, um, at our um, at technology and developing it layer by layer, very carefully, not running ahead in a crazy manner, but maybe as the question asked, with the steady growth, you know, really getting a beautiful thing. And we really hope to be getting in a big way into 
um, philanthropic applications as well. And um, uh, introducing uh, code chains with uh, privacy, possibly, and all these things we're hoping to have at some point. Very cool. No, that that is absolutely a great progression. And it makes sense if this is the future of blockchains for that to be where you guys are heading. Uh, another question from the audience is, what's the approach of Algorand to the proof of stake? And what's the TPS estimate rate for the blockchain? So transactions um, per second. What is TPS? Transactions per second. Okay. So our transactions per second currently, I'm very bad on acronyms, I have to tell you. When I joined the army, when I was 19, everybody there talks in acronyms. I never knew what I was supposed to do or where I had to be because it was just so much. But um, anyways, um, so our current transactions per, section, per second is a thousand, which of course is very, very high. Um, we will have ability to go higher if needed. Um, at this point, this is uh, well beyond uh, what we need in order to sustain uh, um, the things that are running on the blockchain. Um, what is the uh, approach to the proof of stake? Um, as I said, we um, uh, uh, it's a very um, uh, smart protocol that does consensus. Mm -hmm. There is I, I didn't mention before, so I'll mention it now. There is a part in this protocol, which is called the Certition Protocol, which is very, very nice. Each person chooses themselves at random in order to participate in the proof of stake. It's a secret selection, that so nobody knows if I chose myself or not, but I can prove that I properly chose myself, that I deserve to be chosen. And as I said, it's a very quick uh, protocol that runs um, very fast. Every five seconds, we have new block added to the blockchain. Very cool. Um, so more questions from the Wait, audience. Can I just go back to something that Tal said? I, I, I don't think, um, you know, the Americans specifically uh, really appreciate the GDPR and the privacy, um, not only for blockchain, but in general relating to every single aspect of life. And, um, and, and, act, and, 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 and in fact, uh, the GDPR, which allows you to be forgotten, has some tension, uh, which is not completely resolved, as Todd will tell you, from a technological perspective between what's going on in Europe, in the EU, and, and, and blockchain, because blockchain did not exist when the GDPR was originally proposed and, and passed. So this whole notion of the right to be forgotten, which privacy, whether it be your your um, Facebook, your Instagram, your whatever other kind of social medias you might do, including blockchain, has this built in tension between the right to be forgotten and the continuing uh, uh, blockchain recording of what's going on. And some of it is still to be resolved. But I think it's an important thing to underscore, and I'm glad Tal brought it up, because it can also help us to mitigate some of the privacy issues that exist. And also with blockchain to be able to give some of the economic power back to the persons that have been using these social media platforms to be able to package and repackage and perhaps sell their data for their own benefit instead of only for the benefit of the um, the platforms that have been taking them and using them for themselves without any indication or any um, economic benefit for the individuals. People did not understand what was happening when first they started to join these huge media platforms uh, as to what the economic consequences would be for the for the platforms versus the non-economic uh, consequences for themselves. That's a that's a great point. And, I and blockchain that. can help solve many of these issues, but there is an inherent tension. Yeah, that's a great point. I tell people that when you know when things are provided for free, like your G Suite, like your Facebook, you have to understand that you are the product 
Also, data is more expensive than oil right now. So we are giving our data away for free. Hopefully, blockchain can make a way for us to monetize us giving getting giving our data away instead of vice versa. So just yeah, to get yeah, on with the other but, question. But the oil was a nanosecond in time. It's back up to $39. So, uh, <laughs> so um for Tal, a question from Gator Bitcoin. He's asking about, uh, are there any partnerships to be made available on Coinbase or any other platforms? What does he mean by uh, partnerships? Just um, ways that places you guys are listing your coins enable. Um, we are listed on Coinbase. This is in fact new and uh, other places as well. But if you're talking about partnerships, I do want to say again, I mentioned it earlier. We have a 250 million token grant program. And this is a great opportunity for people, you can check it on our website, to submit proposals, to do things with the foundations, to work on the blockchain and to receive tokens um, in, in return for, these, uh, for the work done. And I think that this is a wonderful way really to join the Algorand family. Yeah, great way to incentivize people. Absolutely. Give them some skin and, in the and game. And I agree with Tal from a non from not only from the Algorand perspective, but the general blockchain perspective. It's much better to join and produce something than just trade something. Mm -hmm. And so if Algorand is offering you ways in which you can get granted tokens for producing product, it's much more sustainable for the ecosystem than to buy and sell and buy and sell. Uh, though that's great for liquidity, but it's not necessarily great for long-term benefit. Absolutely. Great point. So and I want to mention yet another program, which I forgot. We also have an incubator program, uh, which is also very interesting. It's really for startups to get mentoring and to get funding in order to uh, move forward. It's going to be a highly competitive program. It's running now. There's still time to submit. You can check for that also on our website. I look Here. forward to the mentoring ship that you do for the uh, for the startups. Yeah, we'll put your website up, Matt. If you could put the website up, that'd be great. Um, so I have someone saying, I think your network is capable of handling a dramatically higher hash rate. I'd like to hear how they plan to make their network bigger to take on more transactions a day. Beyond the five thousand, uh, I mean, beyond the thousand a second that we do today. Um, um, just okay. to we have algorithms that we can do it. Uh, it's uh, really enabling us just to compute uh, more things and to get it done. It's uh, a technical answer. It's not that interesting in the sense for this audience. Okay. But at this point, the 1,000 per second is um, more than we need at this point um, for, the, for where we stand. Okay. And another question is, uh, do you plan to unlock a lot of supply? Okay. This you can read on our website. I don't want to give the, spe the details specifically because I'll probably misrepresent it. Um, uh, everything we have a token dynamics page on our uh, website. You can look exactly and see wh what's going to be released and in what rate. Um, there are... Um, um, early backers uh, of the um, of the company who have committed to help us um, set up the system at the beginning and run relay nodes and they are getting tokens which are released on a daily basis mm -hmm. you can see their um, uh, rate on our website we are releasing tokens through the rewards program every person who has who holds algos immediately gets a bonus so those um, uh, tokens are uh, released into the system uh, steadily. We're releasing tokens through the grant program, which I mentioned, on a regular basis. And uh, we are releasing tokens by the foundation itself, selling tokens. That is also reported on our website, the exact number. So you can see the progression of how things are being released into the ecosystem. And, and 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 that progression and that progression i would say is very highly rooted in tokenomics which is not only a, is not new for blockchain but tokenomics has existed 
as a market contract type of, of economics for quite some time. And so what you do want to do is gauge what your token is versus the economics of it and clearly map that out. And companies like yourselves have, who have economists and, and, and very skilled people that can do that, do that in a way that is not influenced by market factors, but influenced by tokenomics and what they know to be the real uh -huh. economics behind it, as opposed to short-term supply and demand, which is, is not necessarily the way in which to go forward with the project. We've seen that many times this happen. There were people floods, the, the person asked uh, about flooding or, or use words like flooding. Flooding is always uh, ends in a bad result. You need things that are calibrated on economics. This is 100% true. We do have economists on our um, uh, uh, on our team. And basically, these decisions are done completely independent of the um, token price. We do the, the grant program is really dependent by um, what people ask for their uh, to support their uh, work. As, as it rightly should be. Yes, I agree. I agree. But totally. I'm, I'm, I'm detailing this to say this is yeah. determined by the grants. The vesting of the of the node runners is an independent thing. The rewards are set and so on. These things are completely fixed and not dependent on the price of the algo. Very cool. We like things that are not dependent on price. That means you have great fundamentals. I do have uh, two more questions. One is coming from Scott. He says, uh, did we talk about their partnership with Republic? How does Algorand facilitate security tokens? Um, uh, security tokens, we have um, uh, we have our um, uh, Algo, ASA, Algo. So oh, you see, I'm so bad with. Um, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, we'll put it just. We'll put it up later, or go to the website, you guys, if you're interested in. <laughs> so I, 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 I could just say, I could just say that that the republic, that the republic offering, um, which is, I assume, the same one I'm talking about, to raise money for startups, has been long, long, long in the workings, and that the algorithm, uh, that the Algorand um, blockchain is supporting that um, by, in, in terms of the blockchain and they are supporting it in terms of the token and the companies in which they would be investing in and persons that have the tokens would be able to then gain a share of the profits or a share of the distribution relating to those, those startups. So I think it's, it's been a very long-term project one that they're going to look for now, from what I understand, additional, not, um, uh, but additional SEC uh, clearance to even raise the level of their funding even further. So okay. it's a bravo to them that they got this part done and let's look forward to the next parts. So first of all, ASA is our current standard asset. And the uh, second thing I want to say about Republic specifically, I was so flustered by the acronym, that uh, this is um, a project being run by the Inc. and not by the foundation. It's a more, um, we're more on the community, on the ecosystem building and so on. And this is um, uh, a project that is really being um, uh, handled by the Inc. Cool. Thank you for answering that question. All right, so I have one more question. This one's a little bit funny, and I'm. Uh, this person says that he believes your market cap should be a billion dollars, uh, but he's asking, can you guys alter your logo to look like Star Trek the same way the U.S. Space Force did, so we can make Algorand astronaut memes? Is that something you can bring up the chain towel for us? So I'll say one thing about the thousand about the billion dollar market cap. Okay. Uh, it, I, I agree that we should be a very influential um, a blockchain. I think we are already given our young, young age. And I think that uh, things with Algorand, as Donna said, we're really looking for the long term, for being around for a, a meaningful amount of time. And I think that over that time, we will reach that market cap. This will be. 
um, uh, uh, sort of the valuation of this blockchain, possibly even more. I don't, because a billion is just five times what we are now. I think we can be way more than that. We're slowly building what we need to do in ways of applications, in ways of the technology, enhancing everything, and we're really looking long term. I think Tal says it very, very well. I mean, a number is just an illusion. I think what what is the foundational elements behind it? What are the brains? What is the thought process? What is the economics? In what is the technology is much more important than did you reach that number? Because the number is a fading thing. What you need to is grow on a sustainable basis, and then be able to attain what your what your um, financial market caps are, and then you grow more than that. And so it is the solid foundation, the people, the team, the technology that determines ultimately, ultimately the market acceptance. To 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 peak too early is never too good. Absolutely, because what you're right booms are followed by busts. Bust. So <laughs> with that, ladies, thank you so much for joining. Tal, thank for definitely going to hear some more about Algorand. Um, please, everyone who's listening, thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our mailing list at blockchaincenter.com. Like this video um, and subscribe to our channel if you have not already. Tal, I have a feeling that I'm going to get some people wanting to do a deeper dive. So I'm going to probably have you on again. Uh, but thank you so much. Always happy to. Thank you. It was wonderful. For sure. Bye. Bye.